Hey everybody, welcome to the Hit or Die podcast, episode 65. <laughs> hey everybody. Hey. Come on, baby. Hey everybody. You're here with our hosts, Jake Saldate and Chad Rothford. <laughs> you guys are giving me crap about how I say last names. Anyways, uh, we also are here with um, Madera High Baseball head coach Andy Underwood. No, I know you probably think we're doing a Bush League, but we're not. Um, we're actually... <clears throat> Doing an interview of Andy and uh, um, his trials and tribulations, or is that what you say? His journey. His journey. His path through this through baseball. fun-loving game. <clears throat> and he's got a lot of good stuff uh, that will help out. Hopefully, the, I know we say hopefully young kids listen to this, but they don't. Well, no. So, I did. I was looking uh, at some analytics. If it was like on Call of Duty in between games, they might check it out. Yeah. It said our, our uh, I forget which side it was, but it has like your demographic, and it was basically like 34 to 44 year old males. Yeah. Sounds or, about so right. it's like your friends, I guess. Yeah. So if you have kids that play baseball, this would be a good episode for helping probably with the mental side. Um, Most of them. Yeah. I'm pretty good for that. I mean, all our episodes are freaking awesome. So humble. <laughs> Well, do I need to be humble in this, in this day and age? It's about me, 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 me. That's you true. Know? So that's I true. Mean, I, I'm still waiting to get a video of CJ. He's going to commit um, to what school he wants to go. So to. you have a good scap load, um, then uh, really so gets into his lower half. We're going to get there when he turns five. We're going to commit to. Okay. I asked him the other day. I was like, "Where do you want to? Where do you want to go to school? Where do you want to commit to?" And he's like, um, "Nani's house, which is daycare." <laughs> so he's well, as of now he's committed to daycare. So. Yeah, Henry was. Uh, he was hitting some wiffle balls over the uh, the fence last night in the backyard. I was, dude, you're ready for TCU tomorrow. Let's go. You know, <laughs> let's go. And then just, uh, also, yeah, no, go ahead. Go nothing. ahead. Yeah, go, I go, go. you. I no, 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 you. nothing. No, and then just the last episode has actually done pretty well. Um, yeah, and it's. Thanks for I'll say it. I mean, <laughs> the haters are gonna hate. But I guess they listen. I mean, that's for sure. People listen. They might not have liked or retweeted or you know, but guess what? They wanted to know. What Tom Donald had to say. Yeah, the numbers don't lie. <laughs> no, they don't lie. And it was a great episode. I learned <clears throat> a lot just on the coaching side of, like, you know, how he built that program up at Buchanan. <clears throat> and obviously he's going to have to start all over again, you know, at Bullard. But there's yeah, some stuff in there different. that's like <laughs> you don't even think about stuff you should do or, you know, that probably helped keep guys at Buchanan or, you know, that kind of thing. But – I learned a lot, but you learn like, you learn a lot on all our episodes. But that was a good one. It was it was better than I thought I was going to be. Yeah, and then it's been a year. We've done Congratulations, our... guys! Thanks, it's really buddy. cool. Thanks. A lot of good guests. We Appreciate didn't think it. it was going to last a year. No, I I mean we can last as long as you want. This thing's awesome. It's almost like another full time job. Yeah, to be honest, for you. Well, yeah, but I don't. You don't let me do any of the editing stuff because you're very. Uh, meticulous about. Yeah. I was gonna say another That's, word, but you're very meticulous. You can at, say it; it doesn't matter. I was gonna say anal, but you're, <laughs> no. you're very meticulous. I think Jake, Jake's just got a better filter. He cuts out all the uh, the stuff. I, everybody's Chad in good would, hands. Chad I would, just, would just post it. He would leave it all yeah. in. Why? This Why? this is us. We gotta cut it. Why? <laughs> uh, because I don't think people know he should have said that. <laughs> Probably should have said that. Yeah. Well, it really hasn't happened very much. No, I'm just saying there's editing to every episode. There's always a lull or something. I love the ones that there's none. Like with the one we're going to have today. Yeah. It's going to be great. I bet. So you keep that in mind. We're not editing. So you talked about (laughs) scaps a minute ago. And I'm sure before we get into you, there was a a tweet over the weekend uh, from Premier Pipeline, which I think has been deleted since. And I actually didn't read the scouting report they did, but they put together a 10U, 10U yeah. scouting report, so scouting, 10 under, 10 under. S- scouting notes from a, a tournament that they had. And uh, so when I zoomed in to read some of the notes, I'm not going to obviously say the, the kids' names, but the very, well, one of them says, uh, good scap load from a 10U player. Live arm, long wind up, but sinks well. The next one was carries. Did he say he sat sixty miles? He an hour? sat sixty miles an hour. It's impressive. His scap load was good. Good, whatever that is. You know, I played 
pro ball and I've never even heard of a pitcher scap loading anything. What is that? It sounds like oh. a piece of equipment that like you use for like your scap, doing isn't roads. That, isn't your scap like your it's in your back. Bone. Your back. Oh, it's your so bone. I mean they're talking they're know. they're talking about loading like the back muscle like a rubber band, but it's it's a ten year old. The the other one was carries well through glute. <clears throat> His butt talks. Yeah. Gets into it. Maintains carry down mound. And people are paying for their ten U kids to get scouted. This was and I saw this on Jeff. For this? Jeff Fry retweeted it. That's where I saw yeah, it. She gone. She gone. Um, Go on. check him out. It's, uh, where does the he she, live? By the, the way, Shigon movement is really good. Where's he from? Texas. In Texas. Cool. I'm not exactly He's sure off. the city, but yeah, he just did another video about uh, um, <laughs> another drill that we saw. <laughs> he got this drill from some guys doing a drill about um, <laughs> fouling balls off. <laughs> it's called the it's called the deep two strike hitting drill or something like that it's <laughs> the ball's literally behind you okay and, and you're trying tilted <laughs> right is tilted and you're working on your two strike okay battling Just it off fouling a ball off. Fouling yeah. the ball off yeah you basically guess wrong sounds good so he's like so with two strikes you're guessing off speed for some reason when you shouldn't be guessing off speed <laughs> and you're working on fouling off a fastball that you're just late on. Well, I want my kid, I want to pay money for my kid to learn how to foul off a pitch. And not only that, he said, yeah. you know, this is uh, this is something you're going to do five times in your whole career. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just uh, the she gone movement is big and we support it. Uh, and it's, it's fun to fun. watch. It's yeah. funny to watch. Yeah. 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 But back to these little kids, it's like 10 years old. <clears throat> when we were 10. I mean, I wasn't even thinking of. Dude, any I was. Of that I stuff. was trying to be on a majors little league team. I yeah. didn't want to be minors. I was trying to make. Yeah. Ma- like, I, dude, all I cared but even about. Even then, you wanted to play, and then we were gonna go pl- like swimming or something. Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. All go I wanted to do when I was. 10. I did not. Honestly, I had no idea what how hard I threw. I didn't care. Didn't care. No. It doesn't mean anything. No. All I cared about was wiffle ball, swimming, then basketball, then swimming, then video games, then swimming, then eating popsicles. <laughs> And then swimming. And, and then, then swimming. swimming, yeah. 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 yeah I, I, I just, it's a joke. It's a joke. And if, if you're a parent out there that's literally <clears throat> thinking about getting your kids scouted, like I, I actually, I told my dad, I, I don't even think I'm going to have my kid play All Stars. Because what's the point of All Stars? Like it. Well, it, that, like that's, a, that's yeah. a reward, though. That's, yeah, that's, cool. that's being honored. Yeah, but you know what I mean, if you, if you look back on just my experience, like we didn't even travel like as a family. You know, we never <clears> went on <throat> vacations. Like our vacation was our all-star team going to the coast or going somewhere. Like that was our vacation. And I'm like, I didn't even go to Disneyland like ever my entire life until I was in 8th grade and I went with a friend. Yeah. Like I didn't get to do things because of baseball and all-stars. And I get all-stars is like great. You're you're one of the best <clears> players. <throat> you get to play all-stars. But is it that important to miss out on your entire summer? to do family stuff, you know, or, or like, I wish like what we're doing with our kids. I wish I could play golf in the summer or learn golf at a young age. Cause now we're older, we're out of the game. Golf's like something we do for fun. Yeah. You know, it's like, that would have been nice to do, you know, when you're younger. So I don't know. That's just my point of view <clears throat> is I just don't think it's important. All-stars now playing with your teammates and getting that. And yeah, you get picked on the all-star team. Great. But I don't know. Until you get to like junior high or high school, that's when it finally means something to. See, I remember my twelve year old all stars. I tried to stay home <clears throat> from going on vacation, which was stupid at twelve year old to think. I look back now and I was like, yeah, that was a, that just. We went to Disney World, mm. right? and I played like I played like the first three or four weeks of all stars, and we just kept winning. And this trip was booked. You know, what I mean, my parents are going to leave me <laughs> here while I'm there in Florida. And so I had to go on the vacation. And I came back, and we were still winning. They were still playing. So See, they didn't even need I you. can top that one. And then they tried to cut me, and that's a whole other story. I wish my dad was here to tell it. But, well, uh, your scap load wasn't that my good. My scap load was yeah. a little off. You weren't getting low in the glute. Yeah, I just, yeah, 10 you have fun. Enjoy playing baseball. Little can, league, have fun. Yeah, yeah Jake, little league. Be a kid. Listen to this. So <laughs> We're starting now. Here we listen go. Listen to this. So var- I was on the varsity basketball team. Summer, mind you. My sister's getting married in San Diego, and I got a summer league basketball game at Clovis West, like a tournament. I skipped the wedding to go to that boy. <laughs> That's how dedicated I was. 
to something that didn't even. It How's your relationship with your sister? No which, boy, no which, bueno. Which one? I don't even uh, know. My oldest. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's good. It's fine. It's normal. Yep. Hey, but that's you know, I don't know. Let's get into it. Yeah. Um. So, Madeira guy. <clears throat> yeah. And you come through the little league program, the Babe Ruth program. And at what point did you like realize that you had some pretty good tools? Um. As far as being like a pitcher, I, th- I think um, even like 12 years old, 13, 14, I, I saw myself accelerating in that and uh, kind of separating myself from other people that I played with um, in that area where I had a better feel for pitches. You know, I could locate a breaking ball, you know, fastball change up. So probably around 12, 13, I started to definitely feel like that. Did you – so I know we were joking about kids right now and being young and enjoying, you know, Little League. At 13, 14, like, did you start taking it a little more? Like, okay, this is something. I'm, I'm pretty good at this. Like, obviously, you were pretty good at basketball as well. But, I mean, baseball was something that, like, you were dominating guys two years older than you um, that you started taking a little more serious. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I, I loved all sports. I loved doing everything. Um, I, was, I was as much committed to basketball as I was baseball. Um, I mean, I was in the basketball PE class all through high school, so I never even trained for baseball all throughout the year until I got into my spring semester or the, the spring semester. Um, so, I mean, I, I was, I want to say, well rounded, where I, I didn't focus uh, everything on baseball until I got to Fresno City. So, so you get to Madeira your freshman year. Have you, like, where, where did you see yourself, you know, JV, varsity, that kind of thing? Um, you know, after Thomas Jefferson going into Madeira, where were you sitting? You were Fresno. Well, you freshman. were here. Your freshman year was Escano's last, right? Correct. So, I mean, my freshman year, I, I was um, – I didn't know, man. I was just trying to play with my friends. I, I never had, like, the thought of, oh, I want to be on JV, have to be on JV. I wanted to play with my friends. And I knew I had a really special group, uh, that 2000 grad, 2003 graduating class, you know, with Lappin, Moran, Pasma, Wilkins – uh, Billy Hume, yep. uh, Kevin Willett. There's just a lot of guys who who were Duarte was on that. Duarte, team? no, he was younger, younger than, than us. that. Yeah, Jeez, he was younger. Least. He was two or three years younger. So I just wanted to be with my teammates and play with them and uh, keep that going. So I never had like the feeling where I had to be on JV. And if anything, I was I was probably scared or nervous to go up and play with older kids or kids I wasn't familiar with because I'm I'm a little bit more of an introvert. So I don't necessarily I don't excel being around a bunch of new people for sure. Do you remember being called up to varsity as a sophomore? I do. So they, uh, Zavor, he told me, Hey, you're coming up today. So I, I, I practiced with him one day or, or played in a game. I can't remember which was first, uh, probably the practice part. And the very next day, excuse me, the very next day, I just got dressed and went to JV practice again with my JV teammates <laughs> Cause I didn't want to go back up cause I was nervous, man. And, uh, I was, like I said, I'd rather just be with my friends. And, uh, so they sent some guys down looking for me, Hey, get back up here. And I did the exact same, the same thing the next day and went back to JV, JV practice again. <laughs> I didn't really want anything to do with that. it. No, I didn't want anything to do with it. To be honest, there was, uh, I think when I was a sophomore buyer, he was a senior Reggie Arder. Like those guys intimidated me, man. Like there was like in today's game, when you go around um, freshmen or sophomores, the seniors are like like super accepting of these kids. Like they're all buddies. When we were in high school, there was definitely like a separation. Like you're on the bottom of the totem pole and I'm up here. And nowadays, you know, seeing I feel like everybody's just kind of meshed in with each other. Well, and stepping on that field too is probably, you know. Again, and, and I think Tom Donald kind of touched on it like <laughs> – he didn't want guys getting used to that varsity field at a young age. Like that's a, that's an earned for sure thing. That's a privilege to be up there. Well, that's speaking on that. I mean, that's something that's kind of ingrained into our community where, you know, Babe Ruth is on that field from these kids are 13 years old. So, uh, it kind of gets ingrained to them where they feel like that field is their kind of their, their right in a way. Yeah. I remember playing on it too. I mean, just I mean, so you know, I was 03 or 01 also. 
Good. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't scare me, though. <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> we were teammates. And Dave Nilsson, too. Yeah. Those guys scared me, man. LASIK. He didn't scare me. I think Bowman was a junior. Then. Bowman was a junior. Yeah. He didn't good. scare you. But your first outing, your first start at varsity was against, a, I think, an undefeated number one ranked Buchanan team. Yeah. Which we talked about last week just for a second. And... You think or it was? It was mentioned. No, you think it was against them? Oh, no. I, 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 no it was, It was right? against them, yes. It was, yeah, it was sure. Buchanan. Yeah, they, so they he had, threw you in the fire. Yes. Yeah, they were uh, – They were first week they were ranked number one in the state. I think they uh, – Chatsworth was ranked number one, and then they kind of flip-flopped. So the first week they were ranked number one, I got my start against them. And I was too, you know, kind of dumb to know. I just went up there giving the old Uncle Deuce ball – <laughs> they didn't know what to do with it. So I ended up um, kind of going through that game. The only run they scored, there was a runner on third. I threw a breaking ball that hit the front edge of the plate and bounced over the catcher's head. So the only run they scored was off a pass ball. Um, and the one thing I remember, it was kind of like my coming out party in a way, where it was the seventh inning, top of the seventh. We're up two to one. Three, four, five hitters were coming up for them. Struck out three, four, five. So that was like my here I am. Finished it, you know, it running the the K mill on the. You don't the well, seventh. you don't see that anymore either. Like how many nowadays, <clears throat> you bring a guy up for their first start as a sophomore, how many coaches are leaving them in to finish that up by one, facing three, four, five. Yeah, I mean that was looking back at it, it was kind of a it was just a weird experience overall. You know, I remember getting that last out, and then everybody from the dugout came out and rushed the mound. Um, and then I remember in the paper, Madera's got a pretty cool paper where they highlight our athletes, the Madera Tribune, and Tyler does a good job with that. Um, I remember being on the front page of that paper, and it said that the headline was Giant Killer. And I just remember seeing that and just, like, just loving it. Yeah, you ended up being probably our best pitcher down the stretch. Um, Till Clovis High showed up. Yeah. Sorry, Jake. No, that's all right. He's still sad. They were pretty them. good, man. They were very good. They were a pretty good team. Yeah, but, they I mean, just we finished had, us off. We, we, we faced them in the first round, <clears throat> and then you guys got them in the second to go to the Valley, right? Was it to go to Valley? I don't no, know. I, I it think was it was second round. I think it was second round. I think they were still third and fourth round to go. Okay. That got them to the, to the semis. I think it was a quarterfinal game. Yeah, they got to the semis, and then they had Buchanan in the final. But Yeah. Um, that's also back at a time where, you know, 500 – Records didn't get you in the playoffs, and and you had to kind of win. You had to finish in a certain spot to get there. Um, not yeah. Every, not everybody went. So uh, I don't even know how we, we worked a home game out somehow there. We must yeah. have a pretty decent. Yeah. I don't remember the overall record, to be honest with you. I know we yeah. rattled off like 12 in a row and um, finished pretty well. But we had two sophomores, him and Calvin Barron, down the stretch were our best pitchers to finish the year. So, um, But you talked about your coming out party. I mean, obviously – you had more confidence, and I don't really remember your guys' junior, senior year, but at what point – was there any point where college recruiting started to step in and it became real, like, oh, man, this is going to get me an education somehow? Uh, I mean, yeah, definitely there there was that out there. Um, as far as, like – I mean, back then, you know, I did a few things. Like, uh, you know, I tried out for a perfect game. I didn't make perfect game because I didn't have a 90-mile-an-hour fastball. Uh, I did the Dodger Elite, so I, I made that team and got to pitch in Dodger Stadium, which was really cool. Um, but that's really all I did. I never went to you know showcases or, or tournaments or the one thing I, I was talking to a buddy of mine about is you know coming from Madera, um, you know it's kind of a point of pride for me where I never took a lesson in my life. I never paid for a lesson. I never went to a lesson. Um, Neither of my parents played sports growing up, so it was kind of like 100% self-taught kind of thing, and I take a lot of pride in that. You know, as far as I got with, I shouldn't say limited um, access to tools and things, but, I mean, it was just self-taught and love of the game. Yeah, kind of not knowing <clears throat> what – for you, that was just normal. Yeah, you know, no. You didn't know – you didn't have connections or this no, and I that. No, I had nothing. There was – Go play. I just went and played. I went and played. There's also different times. Like we were talking earlier, there wasn't a whole lot of travel ball. It was like summer ball with your high school team, legion ball in the fall with your high school team. Um, you kind of had to take a break. There wasn't yeah. 
there wasn't a lot of traveling tournaments going on at right. the time. I know Z would take teams to Arizona or Florida, but other than, I mean, it was with your high school team. Right. So there wasn't really a lot of. And, it, you know, there wasn't scouts sitting there. It's, you know, we went to the National Classic in like Westminster in Florida. There's not, there wasn't a single scout in the stands. We went to Arizona a couple of times, not a scout in the stands. We went to San Diego and, um, you know, Irvine area. Not, a, there wasn't scouts there. We just went and played. I think we were in that San Diego tournament yeah. you guys, in summer. Speaking of that, I remember we were on, like, our team, Madera High, was up on the fourth floor of the hotel. And uh, I got off the elevator, and I'm walking down to room, I don't know, what, 412 or something. I'm walking in. I walk in the door, and it's all Bullard guys sitting in their room playing video games. And they all looked at me, and I was like, whoop, wrong room. <laughs> I just ran out of there. Uh we kind of talked about this earlier too. Uh, being from Madeira, did you ever feel like there's, like the grass would be greener somewhere else? No. All I ever wanted to do is play with my buddies. I was Madeira, Madeira blue, you know, to my core, man. Um, but like, do you think going somewhere else would have brought different offers? No. For school? No. 100% no. Um, again, that was. That was a point of pride being from Madera and just smoking every Clovis team out there. You know, with me, Lappin, Moran, like all those guys. Paz. Paz. I mean, we wanted to just smoke those guys, you know. And, and the guys that gave us competition was Clovis High and Buchanan. We rolled through everybody else, and we we would usually split with the other two. Um, you know, th those were the people, the teams that, that we rivaled the most, and we just – we had like a true – uh, I want to say hate for him, to be honest. Yeah, no, that's that's real. Yeah, it was. I, we had a lot of pride in beating Clovis schools, and so there was there was never a thought of I want to go somewhere else to to be better or to be around better competition because there wasn't. I, I had the best guys on my team. Yeah, and I think people sometimes uh, forget to look at that. Look at the history of of Madera's baseball program. I mean, it's as successful as. A lot of the schools I mean, out there. Look, we've talked about it. If we kept the kids in Madera who belong in Madera, we'd have another five Valley Championships at our school. And the problem is the grass is greener on the other side, or so people think. So they want to pay, you know, five grand a semester to go to Memorial, or you know, they want to send their kid to Clovis West because they think there's better opportunities. It, there's not. You yeah, can't. I mean, you can't hide talent. My kid's gonna go to Madera Ranchos. Well, the the. The th my response to that with like and you know we've lost kids to Buchanan, <clears throat> we've lost kids to Clovis High School, Clovis West, yes, Clovis West, um, Memorial, a lot to Memorial. But I mean, ultimately, it's you know the tracker is. I mean, we can. Well, like you were talking about, like <clears throat> get to Fresno State. Well, you were talking about Still schools that are, you know, pristine and like winning. You look at Bullard and Clovis are probably from old days at the top. Then you got Buchanan. Then you got Madera, Fresno High. I mean, I'm McLean talking about. had a pretty McLean McLean, should be. You know, Edison back Central in the day. Central as well, too. I mean, you have those schools that are all right there, you know, the yeah. four or five spot. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but <clears throat> Memorial's not in that conversation, you know, until the last couple of years. Right. You know, and that's, you know, it is what it is. Whatever they're doing, they can do whatever they want, but. When you get Division One athletes playing in a Division Two league, I think it's a, it's easier to win, you know. And I'm not saying that's the case, you know. They have great coaches over there, but you know, like you said, those kids are at Madera. You have at least two well, or three well, in the last five years. The ultimate point is, is where are those kids going that Madera can't get them there? So look, all yeah. the kids we who can't, I mean, that, that's almost every kid who's transferred out of Madera to go play at another high school, they end up in the same place. They go to a JC. Or they don't play at all. Very few of them are going to get their their Division One scholarship, you know, and that's just a fact. There's only one that's left and went D one out of that other high school. There's only one that year. I mean, as a freshman. So you're saying D1. that the excuse that that is the reason is, they think they're going to really, be D one or whatever. It's not valid. No, no. It's, uh, look at facts. Look at numbers. But you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, we're talking about it. We're getting off topic. Yeah. Um, you do end up at, at JUCO out of Madeira. Yeah. And, I mean, was it just a no-brainer for – I mean, obviously there's no 
was school like an issue at all? Did you have, <laughs> did you get into state? Did you even try to go to state? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was actually, I was offered by Fresno State, Long Beach. Um, I, I, I went down to uh, Stanislaus. I went to uh, UC San Diego on a couple little visits here and there. Uh, but the two offers was from Long Beach and from uh, Fresno State. You also were drafted as a draft right. follow. Yeah, and the reason I was drafted um, was because there was a scout. It was a home game against Buchanan, and there was a scout there to watch Jason Donald. Um, and I, I ended up pitching that game and threw very well. Ended up beating him. And that it was Keith Snyder with the Royals. And uh, that's the reason I was drafted as a draft and follow out of high school, the 40, 41st round. And you ended up at City, who at the time, I mean, that's where everybody went. I mean, if you were a yeah. dude – that wasn't going D one or didn't get that offer, you know, or coach, draft and follow. Yeah, Coach Scott had, you know, his choice of what fifty, sixty kids he had to yeah, come yeah, up with yeah. a roster for, yeah. if not more. Right. So that the uh, the draft and the getting drafted thing was probably uh, had a big reason or a big to do why I went to Fresno City because I didn't love school to be honest. I loved baseball and I wanted to be you know on TV someday. And the best route or the fastest route. Um, I shouldn't say best route. The fastest route for me to get there was to go to a city college because I didn't want to get locked in three years, you know, at a, a D1. Um, so it didn't take much. Coach Scott gave me a phone call. You know, he talked to me for, you know, two, three minutes, and he's probably the best car salesman in the Valley. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he just said they'd be lucky to have me, and, and they feel fortunate. And so that's all it took was a phone call, and I was there. And you ended up being an All-American – were you one too? You both were, right? Yes. I don't know. Thank you. I didn't want to answer. Yes. Yeah. Was Chad an All American? He sure was. <laughs> I think you were the only two, right? On on No. Our freshman year we yeah, had we were four, loaded. four of them. I don't remember who it was me. Jacques, Timmy, you and me. Okay. I think the four of us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I group. might be missing somebody, don't quote. I mean, me. we've it's we hard. Were, it's <laughs> we were stacked. This yeah. is a little different just because we've had these conversations about your guys' time at City. And it was the best as, as somebody who didn't go to city. Um, I hear between Gary and you guys and, and even having Jacques in here, it really sounds like for, for, and you guys both had careers beyond city college that those were the best baseball times. hundred percent. That, that you was, had. that was by far the, the, the most fun two years, um, the best memories, um, it was the place where I developed and blossomed. That was the most growth any two years I'd ever had in my life. Um, you know, with a huge deal with Coach Solberg is my pitching coach. And Ron Scott, you know, he's just a player's coach, man. So for me um, and what I needed as a player, he fit everything I needed as far as a player-coach relationship. Um, and so I felt just super comfortable. Um, my confidence grew there, and that's where I blossomed for sure. And your records, twelve and one both years. Both years? No, no, no. Yeah, I was twelve and one and ten and one. Oh, you were ten and one. Yeah, because we got. Um, oh yeah, we got minimized games. Yeah, we had shorter games. So. And then you games. were also state pitcher of the year one year in there, I think. Both years. Both, both years. years he was. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And again, drafted both years. Nope. No, nope. I was drafted. So here, this is. I thought it was all. Uh -uh. No? So I was drafted after my freshman year. In the, I want to say 21st round by the Royals again. If I had known better or was advised uh, a little bit smarter, I would have completely turned down the draft and follow because in the end of the end of the road, that hurt me tremendously because my sophomore year, every uh, pro team who came to watch were they did not take notes on me. They didn't turn anything into their bosses because I was under control with the Royals. And so a week before the draft. Keith Snyder came into my home, uh, gave me an offer, and it was nowhere near what I was willing to take to sign, and uh, I turned it down. So my name got tossed back into the draft, but because I was under control with that team for the whole year, none of the other teams had, had turned in paperwork on me or were super interested in me. So I didn't get drafted my sophomore year. So at the same, it happened my, me too uh, with, the, with the Mariners is – we signed a contract as a draft and follow. So the the Royals had his rights. The Mariners had my rights. So when they like when people come to scout, they already have us down as Royals have him, Mariners have him. Because normally draft and follow is 
they go with the team that's draft and follows them. Right. And so nobody's scouting us. So when we both turn down our offers to go back in the draft, our names aren't even on anybody's books. Yeah, we're on nobody's draft board. So so that's why he didn't get drafted again and I didn't get drafted. Because they're again. looking yeah. at it's like a safety net for you guys that Yeah, and I, I wish Yeah, if you if I we if, you, if we both would have just said no, I'd rather not be drafted our freshman year, then we go back in where everybody can get us again. Yeah. And that's what – there was a good and bad for the draft and follow. It was good because it got more good players to junior college level. For sure. Um, but it was bad because it did take away from 30-plus other teams looking at you because your rights were taken. Correct. So, And within that, a story I heard for the first time, you had an opportunity. And this is kind of where it gets real. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like where the whole story kind of like – it, it gets real. Like, it's now there's a potential this could be a job for you. You could career playing baseball, and you have an opportunity, and you don't take it. Yeah. So, after my sophomore year, uh, just getting into the summer, I don't get drafted. Um, my my agent or uh, advisor, what you would call it then, because I, I wasn't allowed to have an agent. He was my advisor. Um, he gave me a phone call, and... I was offered a spot to play in Cape Cod. So, you know, being back then, I, I, like I said, I, I grew up in Madeira, just did my own thing. I didn't know much about Cape Cod. To me, it was, um, man, I, I, to be honest, I wanted a break. I wanted a little bit of break for my arm. I had been throwing uh, all fall, all spring. I think I was up to maybe 150 innings or so. And the last thing I wanted to do was to go out to – Cape Cod, and you know, I was like I said, I'm a little bit of an introvert. Um, it's far away, and it's far away. I was nervous, you know, and I wasn't. And here's kind of more where it gets real is I wasn't really raised um, to be tough, to be honest. Um, I grew up a little soft, um, you know, so I didn't have I didn't have the ability to go out on my own at that age you know, where they make you get a job. So you have to work in the morning, at, you know, and they kind of place you somewhere where you could be running lobster racks or something like that or cleaning dishes somewhere and then over, you know, playing. At that time in my life, I, was, I wasn't mature enough to, to take that on. Um, and to be honest, I was scared. I was scared and nervous about all that. So I declined it and went about my business that summer. Is that, is that a regret? Hundred percent to this day. Hundred percent regret because, uh, you know, how many guys get the opportunity to play in Cape Cod to begin with? Okay, it's not very many. If you don't know, it's the the premier college summer league in the country. Uh, it's kind of the cream. And of you're the, a JUCO guy, and I'm a JUCO guy, which is another kind of unheard of thing. They take the top D one um, guys out there and, and they go play. You know, it's the the cream of the crop. The guys who are going to be drafted in the top ten rounds, or you know, so. Which you know, could have helped you too, because being a JUCO guy, you still could have maybe signed out of there. Probably, you know, I, I, yeah, I didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah, I was just kind of on my own. Neither of my parents knew knew any of that stuff either. Like I said, not, neither of them played sports. Um, there was no background in in athletics and which way to go, and there was no real advice. I just kind of did what I felt like doing. And so you you don't go. <clears throat> What got you to Fresno? What was I mean? Obviously, your time at, G, at Fresno City was up. Was that the only one that stayed with you throughout those two years? Uh, did Long Beach reach back out, or were there other other D ones after that? Yeah, so it was kind of the same. I did try to get him to ORU. Yeah, so ORU was definitely on the table. Um, my parents were were, you know, I grew up Mormon, so it was definitely like a, a strong religious kind of a thing right there and going to o ORU is a different religion it's a religious school so my parents were kind of definitely against that for me um Fresno State came back with a very strong um scholarship for me Long Beach uh they gave me a scholarship but the problem with them is you know moving down there the cost of living it would have been a lot more of a stress uh on my family because you know we're not rich or anything so um 
it would have been a lot tougher to make it work at Long Beach. And going down to Long Beach, you know, you had some dudes down there, and, and you know, on the mound, and I could have gone down there and been a, you know, fifth guy out of the bullpen for all I know. So I chose Fresno State, um, and uh, that was that was the guy who got me there was Tim Montez. He was the pitching coach at the time. Uh, loved him. I loved his philosophy. I loved how he worked with people. Loved his personality. He was definitely the reason or the guy who convinced me to um, give it a go at Fresno State. So I signed with Fresno State, and within that somewhere in that summer, he gets let go, and my next pitching coach is Bobby Jones. So I also loved Bobby Jones, who was another really good fit for me. And at that point, you're, I mean, but you're already kind of committed, right? You were oh, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a done deal. No, I, I signed all my, my intent and all that stuff. I was in. Did you feel like when, when it all started in the fall that you were ready to go? Cause, After, I mean, like, because I know hearing guys talk about Batesville now, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what it was like then uh, as far as the demanding in the, the weight room. And, you know, I'm sure his, his academic side <clears> is <throat> no different. He's always put out graduating classes. Um, were you ready for that stuff when you got there? Ready for it. Because um, another thing you said is uh, growing up tough. I don't want to confuse that with you being competitive. Right. Right. Because you, you are were one of the most. Yeah, absolutely. I'm right. The, teammates. I've, I, I've right. told my, our players since day one, like coach Underwood as a pitcher was, you just stay away from him. There's just a difference don't. between what you said is soft because you were the opposite of that on the diamond. For yeah. sure. Yeah, for practice sure. or whatnot. You were the opposite. But I, I mean, I do understand what you meant. I just don't right. want people to confuse yeah, that's that a, with, that's yeah. a good with point. competing. Yeah. Uh, Cause competing wise, there was nothing. There was no missing. softness. No. <laughs> whatsoever. No. Um, but was it enough time to get you prepared for a D1 environment? So being ready for Coach Basil in Fresno State, I don't know if – I don't know anybody who's ready to walk into his program because he is – he's a tough dude. He's a tough coach to play for. Um, and being um, – you know, like I said, how I was kind of brought up and my personality. Coach Scott was perfect for me. Coach Basil is very tough for me because they have opposite – personalities and the way they attack the baseball game which being a head coach now I see both and I, I can appreciate both sides of it his job's on the line so he has to do it his way and, and nobody else's way I can definitely respect that 100 percent now um, you know walking in there man our first semester I think we loaded up with 18 units so my schedule you know was class from eight to noon and then at one o'clock, we're at the baseball field. One thirty at the baseball field. You go practice one thirty to five, five thirty. Then we go weights for an hour, and then you have thirty minutes to eat. And then I have study hall from seven to nine. So that lifestyle was much different. Where before I was kind of just in cruise control. You know, went to class, did okay, uh, went to the baseball field, loved every minute of it. Went home, did my thing. It's just a different world, different environment. Um, did it help out having, you know, one of your best friends there at the time with Lappin? Lap dog. Yeah, for sure. He was definitely a little bit of an icebreaker for Since me. Since he was has been there for yes. two years prior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and just listening to the stories that that Lappin had to go through, um, man, Batesel was was a freaking tough dude his first couple of years there. And the stories I heard, man, they, they made me nervous and, and a little scared going into that program, to be honest. Um but he was definitely an icebreaker for me and, and a true friend where he, he would always kind of pump me up to the other guys or, or tell them, you know, how good I was at this or that. And uh, even before uh, going into my fall semester, you know, he would have me hanging out with some of the guys. So I got to know some people because of him, and he definitely made it a little bit easier for me. And you guys go on and uh, I think you made a – regional that year you're, you're I mean, road that team that pitching staff you talk about long beach <clears throat> your pitching staff was you had three aces yeah we were we were good we had three friday night guys and uh so we went with fister who had a 10-year big league career romero who arguably had uh the best numbers on the staff he was 13 and 2 that year um and then i was 12 and 3 that year as a sunday guy uh you know we, me and romero had just about the same era um you know i had more innings pitched uh but i mean man that was that was a really tough, 
three guys to face. And you guys end up going to Fullerton? Fullerton, Fullerton very tough regional. Uh, if I remember right, it was uh, Fullerton, U, uh, U, uh, USD, San Diego. Yeah. And then the four seed, I, I can't remember who the four seed was. I forget. Somewhere in the Midwest or something like that. But uh, that was that was definitely a tough. That place was rocking. And you guys, uh, you guys don't advance, but you you do get drafted that that year. What was that? Was it? I mean, it's probably a little different now, but I mean, obviously, there's you know, there's draft parties and stuff like that now. But oh, did you kind of have an idea of what was going to happen? Yeah. So you know, between my advisor um, and and meeting with scouts and talking to people, I was slotted to go rounds two to five somewhere in that area um you know on draft day you talk about draft parties i had it was me lapping and uh my catcher frank and my at my parents house just sitting around eating freaking funyuns or something so that was our draft party and uh i remember getting a few calls from you know some scouts hey would you sign for this if we take you in in this round or that round and i remember being on the phone with uh cincinnati reds and they were going to offer me i don't know seventy eighty thousand like seventh or eighth round they're like would you sign my i don't know i mean shoot i don't know talk to my my guy my advisor or something i have no idea what i'm doing and uh i walked back in the house and they're all you know my parents or actually no what happened was um rich Bordy, who was a scout for the padres he called me right after that and he says hey congratulations we just took you you're gonna hear it on the on the it was on- online back then and uh so I was super excited. I, I was drafted in the fifth round and uh, definitely thought that was a good opportunity with the Padres and, and that organization. Was there any emotion? Emotion? Were you like, because, I mean, knowing you, I don't know. I've never known you to be much of a emotional. I think you were kind of, like you said, you're just pumped, ready to go. Like you're more happy than uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, like weight lifted off. So anything. honestly, I was, because I was slotted two to five, you know, and I had heard some things, oh, we might take you here, you know, third, fourth round or something like that. I went in the fifth round, and I was honestly, like, somewhat disappointed, but at the same time super excited because I wanted to go a little bit higher. Um, but, yeah. But it did happen. It did happen. You know, so it's you got to roll with that. And, yeah, for sure. Um, so what was that adjustment like? Because now you're, you're – there is no – I'm not sure if I want to go or leave home. Yeah. It's, it's – I'm gone. Yeah, I'm gone. So – that year, um, what had happened was I was I was so burnt out from pitching so many innings. I was actually third in the country in innings pitched that year, my junior year at Fresno State. And then on top of that, I was um, closing a few games Friday night or, or getting hot Friday night to come into bullpens or to come into the game. And, uh, you know, I think in the fall I ended up throwing, throwing another 50 innings. So I was I was probably close to, you know, 180, 190 innings that year and um i was tired man i was very tired so once my season ended and uh, i i took a break for a few weeks didn't touch a ball didn't touch anything and you know once i i signed they got me on a plane and i was out there you know and i hadn't picked up a ball for a few weeks so just tired uh not really ready to go that summer as far as pitching and again if maybe if i went to cape cod Maybe I'd have made that adjustment a little bit better and, and being able to transition a little bit easier. You know, I remember walking into – I flew into Boise and got some taxi or something to the field out there. It was about a 40-minute drive. And I remember walking into a clubhouse with, with 40 new faces in my face. And uh, it was intimidating, man. And I showed up with um, no collared shirts. You know, knowing me, I, I walked in with like a fishing T-shirt and shorts and – and they all just kind of looked at me. The head coach was like, hey, this is, you know, Andy Underwood, new teammate, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't know anybody, man. It's you And know, the locker room in Boise is probably this size it's, right it's, here. Yeah, it's about a 12 by 15 room <laughs> with 40 people. and um, It's terrible. I think it was carpeted ground, too. Yeah, and then you walk back into the showers, and, man, it's like an 8 by 6 room with 40 guys trying to take a shower. The first night I was there, I didn't – I don't think I showered that entire series after the game. Just went to your. I think I just changed back into my clothes and and got on a bus and and then uh, my first night in Boise, we got back to the hotel room and I tried to check in. Nobody was taking care of me, and there wasn't a room for me. So I was like, uh, I don't know what to do, man. 
So I, I, I talked to people at the desk to get me a room. And, uh, yeah, a little weird, a little awkward. Definitely a rough start for me out there. Well, and it's something that you're not, you know, one, you're not accustomed to that lifestyle. You already, like you said, an introvert. You're already outside your comfort zone. You're in a new world, new faces. <laughs> Cell phones aren't really a thing, right? I mean, the iPhone had just come not, out. Not really, no. I so think, I, I, think I had a still. T-Mobile sidekick or something like that. <laughs> there was still, you know, pay phones outside that yeah. you had to put money into. Yeah, so I had no idea what I was doing. Really didn't. What Was there any point where, like, you were unsure about being there? Like, did you ever doubt being like this is I'm, this isn't my it's not what I thought it was. Well, yeah, definitely not what what I what I thought it was because I, man, I hated bus rides, I hated hotel rooms, and I hated <laughs> going to Applebee's every night for dinner. You know, that was the only place to open at eleven o'clock. You get you know Applebee's or I remember on one trip, I was packing canned food. I, I was trying to open up cans of uh, Chef Boyardee raviolis and just getting into that, just getting after it. Over Applebee's? Uh, we, we didn't have an Applebee's next to us. Because oh. the other team, from what I understand, was in charge of uh, assigning your hotel or whatever. So you kind of you were just at the mercy of what was around the hotel. And I remember I was just like, dude, I'm just bringing some Chef Boyardee with me on this trip. I wonder how different it is now, though. We haven't really talked to you guys about because I remember you I told a story about your pants. The first <laughs> pants that you got issued were worse yeah, yeah, than yeah, yeah. than so worst pair of pants I've ever put on in my life. Worst by far. And I, this is a minor league team, man. I'm showing up, and these pants were uh, they were at least ten seasons deep. I literally there was literally patch holes or, or patches covering holes on the knees, the back. And then they went up uh, halfway up my shin. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wear this thing, man. I'm going to go Greg Maddox, tweeners, look stupid out there, grow a mustache, and let's go. And segue into Greg Maddox. There is a story that you have. Yeah. I think I've you, told it You before. might have told it. I'll tell it again. It's a yeah. great story. So uh, Greg Maddox, towards the end of his career, he was uh, with San Diego. And... Um, you know, we're in spring training. All the minor league guys are on one side. The big league guys are on the other side. And we share – I got two stories about them. So we share um, the same facility as the big leaguers. So the big leaguers have their own separate locker room, but we share the same, like, eating area. So it was super cool. And they took care of all the meals. And so, I mean, it's, we had chefs in there cooking. It was – that was the best thing about that program, man, was that food. Because you walk in for breakfast and lunch, and it was it was lights out. Um so it was, it was early. We got in. I was probably at the field like 7, 7.30. And um, I get my uh, my slides on, got my shorts, got my shirt on. And I'm going through the food line, kind of half asleep. And I get about halfway through the line, and this guy next to me goes, hey, anybody want to share a burrito with me? I can't eat this whole thing. And I turn to my right, and I'm standing next to Greg Maddox. He's right here. And I was like, if I could just go back, I'd be like, dude, I'll share that burrito with you. <laughs> But no, I, I was too scared. I got nervous and kind of starstruck, you know, because he was kind of my idol growing up as far as, you know, a control pitcher and just a dude for me. So, yeah, he, he, he got me. And the second story with him is they told all the minor league pitchers, hey, Maddox is going to throw a bullpen today. If you want to come watch, come watch him. We'll have like a little Q&A after with him. So I'm like, sweet, dude. So every minor league guy is out there, even if you weren't a pitcher, there was probably like 50, 60 guys watching him. And so we're like, where is this guy, you know? Is he going to show up? Well, he walks out of the big league clubhouse. A golf cart picks him up, drives him to the mound about 100 yards. He gets out. The golf cart didn't take off. It just sat and waited for him. So he throws his bullpen. And, uh, I mean, he didn't miss a spot. And then I walked up. Once he was done talking and everything was over, I walked up to uh, the mound. And you, know, you can tell a lot by, you know, a pitcher's story, kind of, you know, their drag mark or where they're landing or what's going on. Well, on the bottom of a cleat, what do you got, like nine spikes? So there was nine precise holes in the landing zone. He land, His landing foot landed in that spike, in those spike marks, 60 consecutive times. It was unbelievable. There was, there was one footprint, one drag mark. It was unbelievable. And uh, then once he was done, got back on that golf cart and rolled back in. It was tight. So red carpet, sure. red carpet. Yeah. 
Um, so take us to the finish of point. Oh, jeez. I know we got to so, get there. We got to right, get so there. So this is like, this is where I question a lot of things in life in general and just everything that happened to me. So um, I start off my first full season great. I was 3-0, and um, off to a good roll. And our team, we weren't very good. We ended up being uh, 28 or 33 games under 500, which you know isn't very good. So it was a struggle, man, going out there and – you know, I pitched in games where I gave it one run and got a loss or two runs, got a loss, or, you know, there'd be games I'd throw a shutout and get a no decision. Um, so I ended up with, you know, I think I was like six and 12 that year. And, and I've never experienced losing in my life, you know, so that was definitely tough and draining. Um, and that wore on me a lot. Um, halfway or about three quarters of the way through that season, maybe halfway through, the big leaguers had their all-star break. So once that happens, the minor league teams get like two, like three days off during that break. It's a little little mini break for us. Well, um, just before we left for break, I was Midwest League Pitcher of the Week. I just rolled off, um, you know, like 16 scoreless innings, rolling, you know, thinking I was kind of the next guy to go up to high A, going to, um, you know, Southern California and pitch for them. And uh, came back from the all-star break, and I threw my first side, and something wasn't right immediately. Where, I mean, if you guys ever watch me pitch or you see me pitch, I was a control guy. You know, I was 88 to 91 where I could locate in, out, up, down, breaking balls, anywhere I want, change ups anywhere. Well, I threw, I threw probably 10, 10 pass balls that day in a bullpen session. And I, you know, you're, you're freaking out a little bit, kind of thinking what's going on. You know, the first day was kind of like, ah, just a rough day. I don't know what happened. I'll get it back. So a day later or two days later, I throw my second side and it gets even worse to the point where I can't even play catch or warm up with a guy where I'm overthrowing him or, you know, you get the yips. And so once that starts, that gets into your head really bad. So my first outing, um, our pitching coach, he got a week off for what a vacation, whatever, for whatever reason it was. So our minor league pitching coordinator was there who I liked. He was a really good guy as well. And so I don't know if there's a little bit extra pressure with that too, but my first outing with him, I, I lasted three innings. Uh, I believe I gave up like nine runs, walked six or seven guys, just awful, just brutal. So it just kept spiraling downhill and got out of control. I get out to one start. I can't remember where we're at. Doesn't matter. So they have, they have a van. So the bullpen is facing. I'm throwing the balls towards the left field fence on that side. There's a, a van parked on the warning track in left field. And before the game, they're doing this big like, you know, ceremony promotion thing where these guys are jumping out of planes and, and parachuting down onto the field. Well, I'm warming up in the bullpen. I probably put like 17 dents on the side of this van, just smoking it like blowing it up and then these paratrooper guys they're walking from the mound back to their van i ended up hitting one in the back of the leg and they're i'm not kidding you they're like 15 feet right of the bullpen catcher dude it, it's that's a pretty lonely feeling when you can't throw it to your catcher and you're going to go out there in front of seven or eight thousand people and try and compete i mean that's the it's the worst feeling in, in the world um so they uh, they put me on the Phantom DL, you know, trying to, to clear me a little bit. So the Phantom DL is, they said I rolled my ankle. I'm on like a 10, 14-day DL. They send me back down to Arizona where I was working with some pitching there, and I, I was throwing in some games down there. And I got to the point where, you know, I was throwing strikes but with zero confidence. My fastball went from 88 to 91 to 82. Well, if you know, 82 doesn't really – play doesn't really play yeah um with no location by the way so it doesn't play you know and the breaking ball's not there changeup's not there nothing's working you know and as i'm throwing my fingers are, are um you know clipping each other so i'm pitching i have my fingers are just bleeding you know there's blood on the ball there's blood on me i, I just can't figure it out. i don't know what's going on my fingers twitching all the time just complete nervous breakdown and wreckage out there um so what happened was 
they had called up Matt Bush. Matt Bush went from a shortstop. He was the number one overall pick by the Padres in like 2005 or 2004 out of high school. Um, you know, and he had an absolute cannon for an arm. Didn't really cut it as a shortstop, so they moved him to the bullpen. He goes from – we basically flip-flop. So he goes up to low A. I go down to Arizona Fall, fall League – or not Fall League, but whatever it is. And uh, he gets out there on his second fastball. He's 98. He blows out his arm. And uh, so I'm there in maybe a week and a half. They say, hey, you're going back out. So I'm like, all right, I'm going back out. So I get out there. And now this time – they got me warming up with the right fielder because starting or whoever's going in the game next plays catch with one of the outfielders. So I'm warming up with the right fielder. And uh, you could tell he was so pissed off and frustrated at me because I couldn't throw it to him. You know, I was either bouncing or throwing over his head. So didn't even want to do that. This time the bullpen's facing, I'm throwing towards the field. So I get up, they're like, hey, you're going in next. I get up and I throw one of my pitches. It goes all the way down to home plate. They have to call timeout and stop the game. Okay, so that's pretty embarrassing, right? Everybody knows looking where the ball came from. Yeah, everybody knows. So very next pitch, same thing happens. We're going to have to call timeout, stop the game. So I, I, uh, I'd had enough at that point. I, I got my stuff, went into the, the dugout, Told my head coach I'm not going in the game. Went and sat in the, uh, the clubhouse the rest of the game. And then after that, they put me back on the the DL or whatever, and that's kind of how I finished out. Now, did you go <clears> – <throat> did they release you in the offseason, or did you go back to spring no, training? No, so they, they sent me back to spring training, and um, it sucked, dude. The, uh, the first day I got there, I started playing catch, and I kind of got to a point where I could play catch – but my velocity was way down. Um, the very first day I play catch, my elbow like sends like a jolt through my right through the nerve somewhere in there. So I go into the trainer's room, and uh, they shut me down for a week. I'm rehabbing, so that uh, that just puts a bad taste in their mouth. Um, and by the way, hanging out in the trainer's room for all the high school guys who think it's cool to hang out in the trainer's room and talk to girls or get taped or whatever, it's not cool. That's not the place you want to be. Um, if you're in the trainer's room, you're injured and you can't play. So that's definitely not the place you want to hang out. Or, or I, We get so many guys who just have to, oh, I got to go get stem. I got to go get ice. I got to go get tape. It's like, dude, just show up and play. Anyways, <laughs> so they shut me down for like a week, and I just stand and I sit there, and I'm just standing, you know, folding my arms, watching practice for, you know, the next week. And then I finally I come back. I'm throwing again. Velocity sucks. Um, and it's a day before or two days before we break out to, you know, wherever you're going to go play. Yeah. And, uh, it was the first day where I, I, wa I wanted to talk to somebody so bad about it. We had a guy in our, our organization who was a coach, but also had like a degree in psychology. And that was kind of his, his area was, was mentally working with kids and talking to them. And, uh, so it was lunchtime and I sat down with him for about an hour and talked to him. And uh, I go back into the, the clubhouse, and the clubby comes up to me and says, hey, they want to see you in the office. So I go in there, get released, and, uh, okay, you know, get a few papers signed. And I'm sitting out there in the clubhouse, you know, and I'm just sitting there in my shorts in front of my locker for 20, 30 minutes. All the guys are getting into their gear and going out, and the guy next to me is like, hey, you coming? I'm like, no, nah, not this time, man. Just got released. So, you know, that got real right there, and it sucked. And I was I was uh, mentally, physically just beat, destroyed. You know, you know, it's your whole identity growing up. Yeah. It's your identity, man. So when you get released, you, you don't know what to do. I went into a very deep depression for about six months where I just I sat in a room and, and did nothing. Um. And then uh, Coach Scott, and they they wanted me to help him coach. And so that's kind of where I took off from there again. But it was tough, man. I haven't heard the whole story before. I'm, I'm sure not many have. No, I, I, you. no, don't tell. Don't talk about it a whole lot. Don't want to talk about it. It's almost like um, it's almost like a whole different life. 
whole different person, a whole different everything. Well, and now you're in your – this will be, what, your 10th year, I think, coming up at Madera High School as the head like coach. That. Yeah. You know, how do you translate all of that? Because I know you're still – you still battle some of those demons. Mm -hmm. um, and Every as, day. And you do too. Every single day I do, Jake. When I, I – and there's days where I'll be driving home – after like a weight room and I just start cussing myself out because I, you know, I was such a freaking soft, you know, cupcake, man. I wasn't, I wasn't tough enough. I wasn't ready to do it. So I don't know. You don't, you know, now what you, you wish you exactly. knew then. I mean, yes. in, in hindsight, right. And that's, I'm sure that's pretty typical. Yeah, for sure. I would have, I would have enjoyed it more. I'd, I'd have had more fun just being around the guys and enjoying it more. And just so many things would have been different. Like you think about that story with uh, Maddox, right? And the foot, where his foot planned and land. You you got to get there if you want to yeah. be a guy. Like you have to get to a point, right? And, and you have to put that work in. Yeah. So here's how I look at. It. So the thing I can take away from it: number one, I, I did have experiences. Uh, number two, it did add stuff to my resume to help me get a job. First of all, um, and most importantly, I can. I can give my knowledge and my experiences to my players, but most importantly, my kids. So if Henry or Max, that's my five-year-old and three-year-old, if they, if they want to um, pursue baseball or any sport or anything in their life, you know, that's competitive like that, I'm going to be there hundred percent for them where I can, I can guide them. Yeah. I can walk them down the right road. I can, you know, get them the right training. Uh, there's just so many things that I wish I knew before getting into it, or I wish I had uh, a mentor or, or somebody like that who could have done the same thing for me. And, and I, man, you got to be an absolute monster nowadays to, you know, in the weight room, nutrition, sleep, school, it's a huge demand, you know, on kids from high school up. Once you get into high school, man, you're strapping it on. If you want to be a dude, um, I mean, you got to eat, breathe, sleep the thing, man. It's a monster. Yeah, you can't jog to it. You got to sprint. No, to it. it's if you're not sprinting to that, whatever that is, that's going to take to get there. You know, like these kids that are going D one this year, the Noah Beals and and uh, Eshawn Hendersons and and uh, Noah Galvans and all these kids, Aon. It's you got to sprint to that. Yeah, you're you got to be punching through the wall. Like you got to be like the first. You want to be the first guy there? Yeah, you should be the first guy there, last guy to leave. I mean, it's true. Like guys who are in the big leagues are there for a reason, and those are the guys who who dedicated themselves and just just you know ate they, it all up. They didn't up. just get by. They didn't get just the get by. Leagues. They well, didn't get by. You were super talented for a, the whole time. Yeah, and it's almost like sometimes you relied on that talent to get to break through the next round. For sure. And at some point it was like, no, now you need to apply some work ethic to right. that talent. Right. And I, I never disco I didn't discover that um that five, six, seven days a week of just pure grind where your your body's hurting and I didn't discover that until I mean shoot, kinda almost recently really, you know, where the importance of it. So again, that's something I can pass down to my kids, you know, and the kids that I have in my program. You know, you talk about Batesel too, I think, you know, as you say, he's tough to play for. And I've heard that from, you know, plenty of players, you know, and maybe that's why guys do get to the show. You know, maybe that's why guys are having careers. And, and, and again, it's just accepting that challenge and going at it head on. Yeah. And, you know, at the time, I didn't like coaches who, who pushed me that hard or challenged me that hard or, or um, you know, verbally challenged me. Or physically challenged, you know, I, I almost, I almost went away from it instead of accepting it and, and going through it, you know. So that that's just, that's just mental weakness. That's all it was at that point. That's just not knowing though what comes with that, and I think it, it got to a certain point with you where you were so good at doing it the way you did it exactly that 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 was just the norm for you, right? And you didn't. Technically, I'm not trying to say you didn't work hard, but you didn't maybe do that extra grind. To put it put it put it this way. Down. I I'm gonna be on. I wasn't coachable. So if a coach had a new thing for me or something to try, it was almost like, well, why? You know, I just 
I've had so much success doing it this way. So when I got to pro ball, guys would tell me like, hey, you should be doing this with your drag footer. And I'd be like, well, I've been doing this my whole life, so why am I going to change now? You know, I wasn't very accepting of, of uh, and it, you know, and maybe that came from just kind of being self-taught and doing it myself my whole life that way. You know, I don't know. But that also, like you said, is going to help you coaching at Madeira. I think it know, has. Coaching, yeah, you know? for sure. I, mean, I think we've, you know, done a pretty good job with our program here. And, and you, you know, allow – you are definitely a, a player's coach at time, but also can turn on that that disciplinary guy. And, and uh, you know, I think they made the right hire, even though, you know, I hate you for hitting. I'm just kidding. I don't know, Jake. <laughs> You'd have been a pretty good head coach, buddy. I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. I you would have been, but that's uh, all good. I, I'm we. I got to cut this all out now. Why? You don't have to cut any of that out because it's not about me. But getting back to the the you know to 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 conclude everything, you know, it is kind of why we do the podcast, <clears throat> right? Because even as a guy that was two years older than you, you know, we all knew this guy is an animal, mm-hmm. right? And to not know some of the things that even you said today, it's like, this is why we, this is important to us. And sometimes uh, we just, you know, we do the show and it's, and it's great and it's fun to do. And Mm -hmm. I've really gotten something from every guest. Um, But when we say we want the younger kids to hear this, this is what we want. This is the the reason they need to hear it. Yeah. Right. Because there's nobody out there around here anyways, telling kids, this is what they need to do. Yeah, and I think, and I tell this to my kids all the time. Um, they, you know, especially being in Madeira and the culture that they grow up in right now, they like they come to our our program, and it's almost like they're only competing against the guys in that same room or on that same team. And I try and explain to them, it, it's a pyramid running up, up to the big leagues, the top tier. And where they're at right now, they're they're competing against the guys a half mile away from them. They're competing against the guys in the ranchos, the Buchanans, the Clovises, not just our valley. Then I explained to them, you're going the entire state of California and Texas and the entire country. And then when you think you want to play pro ball, then you're competing against these Dominican kids who are just eating, breathing, sleeping baseball 12 hours a day. They don't even go to school. Their baseball academy is their school. That's what you're competing against. And so if guys have these dreams of, I want to play D1 baseball. Well, you better do more than what you think you're, you know, you think you're doing enough now, you're not. And, and there's just not enough time that even I have as a coach to give to them. They have to go out on their own and get this. You know, there's so much more that they have to get done in order to make it. It's not just show up, you know, for high school practice or whatever else. Like they need to be putting in extra work all the time. Yeah, all the things that they, the, all the cliches that you hear. They're all true. Yeah, you know, they came from somewhere. Yeah, no, they're know, true. They originated from somewhere. But um, I know just as a friend, I, I, you know, I think it's a fantastic story. And, I, and again, I hadn't heard the end of the career. And I, I remember you talk about the yips and stuff. But, you know, one, you know, the mental side of it is important. And there's resources out there for players to go and check out and, and do so. Do it now. Do it in high school. Do it in junior high. And coaches – Get that stuff to your kids. There's there's numerous books. There's there's tons of video, especially in this digital age. There is resources to yeah, help prepare your team for mental side of the game. You have to be able to decipher and and sift through and filter the crap out there, like what we mentioned earlier in this podcast. For sure. I mean, there's so much crap out there. You got to find guys who are the right guys and, and know what you're. Well, and it goes. You know, I go back to like Drew Maddox's episode, and we we only touched on some of the mental side of things because um, it doesn't just apply to baseball or sports in general. It can, it can be used for things 20 years from now. Right. And, and I think as coaches, and I'm assuming a, there's a good amount of coaches that listen to this, you know, it is our job to, to get that side of it. You know, you've got, you know, you scratch the surface at 23, 24 years old. Imagine that you had it in high school. Yeah. You know, and, for and, sure. and you were super talented. You know, and it still wasn't enough is, is, is all. That's that's the thing. That's the difference is, like, if there was a coach that you had in high school saying, look, you're really good, but you could be better. Or, like, 
you need to push yourself more right. or like, but you know, that, that's that, again, even if a coach told me that back then in my own head, I don't know if I was willing to accept that. I just, I wasn't coachable. Yeah. I'm going to be honest. And you didn't get your humble pie until I didn't get my life. humble pie until I, Been until it was balling. the, the yeah. real deal. It was time to show up and go. Yeah. And that's another good thing with your story is you can, now you have that to somebody like, look, you might think I'm full of shit, but Here's the I, proof. I lived it. Yeah. I, you know, if you want to question what I, and that's, that goes for any guest that's been on this show. Yeah. Say what you want. Go look at their numbers. Everything's readily available. You can go see it, you know, and that's, you know, again, going back to kind of why we started doing this is, is for, for stories like this. Yeah. That's uh, that, that would help somebody not, you know, and it's like, you can't be satisfied with how good you are. No, you gotta, you know, you gotta put in the work and the extra work, and, right. You know, I want to be Mike Trout one day. I want to be Justin yeah, Verlander, yeah. Max Scherzer. You, you, they showed video of Max Scherzer in his bullpen the other day, and they're correcting themselves. And like, here's a big leaguer that has how many Cy Youngs that won a World Series, and he's still trying to get better. Pitching in full uniform, by the way. Yeah, always has a chip. So, man. I mean, it's just, but you, these and like kids Donald, need to realize they need to, you know, step your game up. It's, it's not about being all talk. No, and Jason, you don't hear Max Scherzer talking. You don't hear Mike Trout talking. No. No. And that's one thing Jason said was, you know, be around guys that, that want to push. Right. I always Well, Walden t- said that, too, yeah. with working out. Train around yeah. guys that want to push. 100% so. agree with that. But, uh, you know, uh, love you, buddy. Yeah. Thank you You're for doing this. You're still the best pitcher that I've played with. I don't know. Uh, Here, that, that's a whole other life. I don't even, I don't live that life anymore. But, well, uh, I can live it. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I thank you for doing it, man. And uh, Yeah, we knew it was hard for you. but Yeah, no, it sucks. I think it, it – it helps you in the long run, but you know, hopefully it helps somebody out yeah, there for sure. Hopefully yeah. it does. Yeah, for sure. And if anyone out there is listening and they want to so get a hold of me and you. talk to me more about it or want advice, I'm all always, you know, you can get my phone number off their, uh, or don't, or Jake, don't sit Jake back and, or, you know, if you're a player out there struggling, go to your coach. Yeah, yeah. You know? for sure. Yeah. You know, so. It's going to show that it, it, it does show some toughness. Yeah. You know, that you are able to uh, go to your coach in moments like that. Yeah. You're not soft if you need help. And, and ultimately, that's what the job's for. That's right. why we do what we do. Right. It isn't just about the W's and the L's, although those are great. Um, it's, you know, there's more guys that are going to go contribute to society than they are on a baseball field. And that's, you know, that's where we got to yep. keep our focus sometimes. But uh, anyways, thank you, everybody, for, for listening. Woody, thank you. Uh, that is episode 65 Hit or Die Podcast. Hit or Die. Hit or Die.